Chapter Four of David Elginbrod. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. David Elginbrod by George MacDonald, Chapter Four, The Cottage. O little Bethlehem, poor in walls but rich in furniture. John Mason's Spiritual Songs There was one great alleviation of the various discomforts of Sutherland's tutor life. It was that, except during school hours, he was expected to take no charge whatever of his pupils. They ran wild all other times, which was far better in every way, both for them and for him. Consequently, he was entirely his own master beyond the fixed margins of scholastic duties, and he soon found that his absence, even from the table, was a matter of no interest to the family. To be sure, it involved his own fasting till the next meal-time came round, for the lady was quite a household martinet, but that was his own concern. That very evening he made his way to David's cottage, about the country supper-time, when he thought he should most likely find him at home. It was a clear, still, moonlit night, with just an air of frost. There was light enough for him to see that the cottage was very neat and tidy, looking in the midst of its little forest more like an English than a Scotch habitation. He had had the advantage of a few months' residence in a leafy region on the other side of the Tweed, and so was able to make the comparison. But what a different leafage that was from this! That was soft, floating, billowy, this hard, stiff, and straight-lined, interfering so little with the skeleton form that it needed not to be put off in the wintry season of death to make the trees in harmony with the landscape. A light was burning in the cottage visible through the inner curtain of muslin and the outer one of frost. As he approached the door he heard the sound of a voice, and from the even pitch of the tone he concluded at once that its owner was reading aloud. The measured cadence soon convinced him that it was verse it was verse that was being read, and the voice was evidently that of David, and not of Margaret. He knocked at the door. The voice ceased, chairs were pushed back, and a heavy step approached. David opened the door himself. "'Eh, Mr. Sutherland,' said he, "'I thought it might a blins be yourself. "'You're welcome, sir. Come but the hoose. Our place is but small, and you'll no mind sitting doon with our own souls.' Janet, woman, this is Master Sutherland. Maggie, my do, he's a friend of yours, all, all day old already. You're kindly welcome, Master Sutherland. I'm sure it's very kind of you to come and see the like of us. As Hugh entered, he saw his own bright volume lying on the table, evidently that from which David had just been reading. Margaret had already placed for him a cushioned armchair, the only comfortable one in the house and presently the table being drawn back they were all seated round the peat-fire on the hearth the best sort for keeping feet warm at least on the crook or hooked iron chain suspended within the chimney hung a three-potted three-footed pot in which potatoes were boiling away merrily for supper by the side of the wide chimney or more properly lum hung an iron lamp of an old classical form common to the country from the beak of which projected, almost horizontally, the lighted wick, the pith of a rush. The light perched upon it was small but clear, and by it David had been reading. Margaret sat right under it, upon a small three-legged wooden stool. Sitting thus, with the light falling on her from above, Hugh could not help thinking she looked very pretty. Almost the only object in the distance from which the feeble light was reflected was the patchwork counterpane of a little bed filling a recess in the wall, fitted with doors which stood open. It was probably Margaret's refuge for the night. "'Well,' said the tutor, after they had been seated a few minutes, and had had some talk about the weather, surely no despicable subject after such a morning, the first of spring. "'Well, how do you like the English poet, Mr. Elginbrod?' "'Spear that at me this day week, Master Sutherland, and all Ablins answer ye. "'But know the night, know the night.' "'What for no?' said Hugh, taking up the dialect. 
For a thing, we're nae clean through wi' the old sailor's story yet, and gin I had learned a thing aboon another, it's no to pass judgment upon halves. I have seen ill weather half the summer than a throng cornyard after in all, and that of the best. Knew that I'm ill pleased with the bonny ballant either. Weel, will ye just let me read the love of it till ye? With muckle pleasure, sir, and money thanks. He showed Hugh how far they had got in the reading of the ancient mariner, whereupon he took up the tale and carried it on to the end. He had some facility in reading with expression, and his few affectations, for it must be confessed he was not free of such faults, were not of a nature to strike uncritical hearers. When he had finished, he looked up, and his eye chancing to light upon Margaret first, he saw that her cheek was quite pale, and her eyes overspread with the film, not of coming tears, but of emotion notwithstanding. Well, said Hugh again, willing to break the silence, and turning towards David, what do you think of it now you have heard it all? Whether Janet interrupted her husband or not, I cannot tell, but she certainly spoke first. Tisva, equivalent to Pshaw. It's all lees. What for are you knitting your brows over a lean ballant? I have hers as well as lees. I'm no just prepared to say so muckle, Janet, replied David. There's many a thing at lees, as ye call it, at no lees all through. You see, Master Sutherland, I'm no glad at the uptake, and it just takes me twice as long as other folk to see to do its side of a thing. Well's a sentence ill look to me clean nonsense altogether, and maybe a whole book after, it'll come upon me at once, and fags, it's the best thing in all the book. Margaret's eyes were fixed on her father with the look which I can only call faithfulness, as if every word he spoke was truth, whether she could understand it or not. "'But perhaps we may look too far for meeting sometimes,' suggested Sutherland. "'Maybe, maybe. But when a body has a suspicion of a troth, he should never let sit till he's got neither hit or an assurance that there's nothing there. But there's just a thing in the poem that I can't put my finger upon, and say that it's no right clear to me whether it's a straight for it or no.' "'What's that, Mr. Elgenbrod?' "'It's just this.' What for are the sailor men Feldoon died, and the child that shot the bonny birdie, and did all the mischief came to little hurt in the end, comparatively? Well, said Hugh, I confess I'm not prepared to answer the question, if you get any light on the subject. Oh, I dare say I may. A heap of things comes to me as I'm taking a donder by myself in the gloaming. I'll not say a thing's wrong till I have tried it o'er and o'er, for maybe I have not a right grip of the thing of a fall. What can ye expect, David, of a laving corp and of that? Ay, twa hundred corps, fewer times fifty twa hundred, and angels turning sailors and songs going fleeing about like, lava rocks and tumlin doon again, tired like, couldst preserve us. Janet, do ye believe at ever a serpent spake? Who, David, the devil was in him, ye ken. The devil, a word of that is, the word itself, though, rejoined David with a smile. David, said Janet, solemnly, and with some consternation, you're not going to tell me, sitting there, I did not believe ilk a word that's printed between the two boards of the Bible. What will Master Sutherland think of ye? Janet, my bonny lass, and here David's eyes beamed upon his wife, I believe as many of them as ye do, and maybe a wheen more, my doughty. Keep your mind easy about that. But ye just see if folk were not altogether satisfied about a serpent speaking, and so they look at a boot and a boot till at last they found the devil in him. Good kens whether he was there or no. No, ye see who, given he was to look weel about the corpse and the angels and that queer stuff, but oh, it's bonny stuff, tea. We might fond in with the something we did not altogether expect, though we was looking for it all the time. So I might just think about it, Master Sutherland, and I would fain read it o'er again, afore I lip and on giving my opinion of the matter. You could leave the bit booky, sir. We must take good care of it. You're very welcome to that, or any other book I have, replied Hugh, who began to feel already as if he were in the hands of a superior. 
Money, thanks, but you see, sir, we have enough to chow upon for an out days or so. By this time the potatoes were considered to be cooked, and were accordingly lifted off the fire. The water was then poured away, the lid put aside, and the pot hung once more, in the order that the potatoes might be thoroughly dry before they were served. Margaret was now very busy spreading the cloth and laying spoons and plates on the table. Hugh rose to go. "'Will you no bide?' said Janet, in a most hospitable tone, "'and take it head potato with us.' "'I'm afraid of being troublesome,' answered he. "'Nay fear of that, given you can just put up with our homely meat.' "'Make nay apologies, Janet, my woman,' said David. "'A head potato's I good food for gentle as simple. "'Sit ye down, Mr. Sutherland. Maggie, my do, was the milk?' "'I thought Hockey would have a droppy of het milk by this time,' said Margaret, "'and so I just looted out the last. "'But I'll have it drawn in two minutes.' "'And away she went with a jug, commonly called a decanter, "'in that part of the north in her hand. "'That's hardly fair play to Hockey,' said David to Janet with a smile. "'Hoot, David, ye see we have not a stranger ill good night "'But really,' said Hugh, I hope this is the last time you will consider me a stranger, for I shall be here a great many times, that is, if you don't get tired of me. Give us the chance at least, Master Sutherland. It's no small privilege to folk like us to have a friend with so muckle book learning as ye have, sir. I'm afraid it looks more to you than it really is. Well, you see, we might all look at the stars from the height of our own eye, and ye seem nigher to them by a long growth than the loves of us. My man, ye ought to be thankful. With the true humility that comes of worshipping the truth, David had not the smallest idea that he was immeasurably nearer to the stars than Hugh Sutherland. Maggie, having returned with her jug full of frothy milk, and the potatoes being already heaped up in a wooden bowl or bossy in the middle of the table, sending the smoke of their hospitality to the rafters, Janet placed a smaller wooden bowl, called a cowp, filled with deliciously yellow milk of Hockey's latest gathering, for each individual of the company, with an attendant horn-spoon by its side. They all drew their chairs to the table, and David, asking no blessing, as it was called, but nevertheless giving thanks for the blessing already bestowed, namely the perfect gift of food, invited Hugh to make a supper. Each, in primitive but not ungraceful fashion, took a potato from the dish with fingers and ate it, bite and sup with the help of the horn-spoon for the milk. He thought he had never supped more pleasantly, and could not help observing how far real good breeding is independent of the forms and refinements of what has assumed to itself the name of society. Soon after supper was over, it was time for him to go. So, after kind handshakings and good nights, David accompanied him to the road, where he left him to find his way home by the starlight. As he went, he could not help pondering a little over the fact that a labouring man had discovered a difficulty, perhaps a fault, in one of his favourite poems, which had never suggested itself to him. He soon satisfied himself, however, by coming to the conclusion that the poet had not cared about the matter at all, having had no further intention in the poem than Hugh himself had found in it namely witchery and loveliness but it seemed to the young student a wonderful fact that the intercourse which was denied him in the laird's family simply from their utter incapacity of yielding it should be afforded him in the family of a man who had followed the plough himself once perhaps did so still having risen only to be the overseer and superior assistant of labourers he certainly felt on his way home much more reconciled to the prospect of his sojourn at Turry Puffet than he would have thought it possible he ever should. David lingered a few moments, looking up at the stars before he re-entered his cottage. When he rejoined his wife and child, he found the Bible already open on the table for their evening devotions. I will close this chapter as I began the first, with something like his prayer. David's prayers were characteristic of the whole man, but they also partook in far more than ordinary of the mood of the moment. His last occupation had been star-gazing. O oh, thou, what keeps the stars elect, in our souls burning with elect, aboon that of the stars, 
Grant that thy may shine afore thee as the stars for ever and ever, and as thou hands the stars burning all the night, when there's no man to see, so hold thou the light burning in our souls, when we see neither thee nor it, but are buried in the grave of sleep and forgetfulness. Be thou by us, even as a mother sits by the bedside of her ailing wean, and the long night. Only be thou nearer to us, even in our very souls, and watch o'er the world of dreams that they make for themselves. Grant that more and more thoughts of thy thinking may come into our hearts day by day, till there shall be at last the open road between thee and us, and thy angels may ascend and descend upon us, so that we may be in thy heaven, even while we are upon thy earth. Amen. End chapter 4